pleased to present a presentation on perception and public engagement on chronic wasting disease. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to present and thank the Ontario Federation of Hunters and Anglers. I'll try to keep the presentation relatively short. It's a voiceover with PowerPoint. Let me first start by thanking my colleagues and graduate students. You see a long list there. Ellen Goddard, Marty Lukert, and Brenda Parley are professors at the University of Alberta, colleagues of mine who've been working on chronic wasting disease for some year. Lucy, she is a PhD student working with me. John Pattison Williams, a postdoc. Jeff DeRoche, Merlin Wallaka are uh, graduate students working with Ellen and Marty. Pat Lloyd Smith is a PhD student, was a PhD student, now a uh, professor at the University of Saskatchewan. And Margo Pibus and Ann Hubs are with the Alberta uh, Fish and Wildlife Division within Alberta Environment, and they've been integral partners within this work that we've been doing on chronic wasting disease and hunters, which is mostly what I'll talk about today, but also uh, more broadly in the social science and economics components of chronic wasting disease. I thought what I'd do is just give an overview of the of the presentation and then uh, some of the results and then if you wish for more detail you can follow along in the talk. What have we done? We've uh, at least this most of the focus of this presentation is on surveys of hunters. Uh, Alberta resident hunters we've been asking them about perceptions about what their behavior has been in terms of hunting license purchase, activity in hunting, harvests and also about what their interests are in terms of the role of management of chronic wasting disease. We started doing surveys about 10 years ago. We had a, a, a gap. We've uh, been funded recently to start doing surveys in 2018 and 2019. I'll talk about those. And as I mentioned, we're looking at perceptions and behaviors and responses to management opportunities. We've also looked separately at the demand for hunting licenses within the province and mule deer draw licenses in particular. And Ellen Goddard and Marty Lukert and their students have been looking at public perceptions of chronic wasting disease, and I'll show a few of those responses. What's the general conclusion? Um, set of conclusions in terms of hunters, they appear not to be changing their behavior in response to chronic wasting disease. That, that's a blanket statement. Of course, some are and some are not, and some perhaps over time have stopped hunting. But by and large, we're not seeing a significant response to chronic wasting disease yet in terms of trip numbers or license purchases. That doesn't mean that hunters aren't concerned about CWD. They are. There are also some are concerned about human health impacts. Um, one of the issues may be that CWD prevalence is not high enough yet to change behavior in terms of hunting or eating meat or other behaviors. They're very interested in participating in programs that get them involved in management. Um, we've looked at several, several that have been tried in other jurisdictions, and I'll show you some results on those. The general public also has uh, very interesting preferences for monitoring and management by hunters and by other strategies. Um, we'll describe some of those. The preferences appear to be changing somewhat over time. And I think there's increasing support for management and in particular for involving hunters in management. Again, this is the team. You see the University of Alberta faculty members and postdocs and graduate students. I'm gonna start by thanking the, the, our funding support, Alberta Prion Research Institute, Genome Alberta, Genome Canada. And of course, our partnerships with Alberta Environment Parks, uh, Margo Pibus and Ann Hubs, I've already mentioned. And, and we're also part of a much broader team that includes uh, natural scientists, ecologists, uh, genomic experts working on the systems biology of chronic wasting disease. And it's very good to be part of an interdisciplinary team working on these issues. So what did we do? We started in a tw the 2017 hunting season. We designed a survey about hunting effort. We distributed that to 5,000 uh, hunting license holders who had mule deer licenses. Mule deer is the focus in Alberta in terms of chronic wasting disease. That's where we see the highest prevalence. We got about a 20% response where people were uh, completing those surveys, which is quite good, I think, for the types of survey that we do. Of course, you always have to question whether these are, are uh, representative of the population of hunters. Uh, there may be some response bias. But that's something that we'll try to take into account as we uh, analyze the data and present the results. Well, what have we found? Well, not surprisingly, most hunters have heard about chronic wasting disease. Um, some have heard a lot about it. Uh, what are, where are they getting the information from? This is interesting. It's quite diverse. Some from government websites, some from podcasts, some from newspapers. Really quite diverse in the sources of information that they've highlighted as uh, the places that they find about chronic wasting disease. Of course, word of mouth is a, is a very big one, but it really is broad. It's not a single source that hunters are getting their information from. 
Do they think about chronic wasting disease when choosing to hunt at sites or apply for draw licenses to certain heights, sites? By and large, no. Again, that is interesting. Some do, 26% do, but the majority of hunters don't think about chronic wasting disease, at least at the current prevalence levels. These are graphs of questions that we asked hunters. You can see them on the left-hand side. Chronic wasting disease is a threat to human health. It will result in, in uh, it may eventually disappear. It will be eradicated. So we've given them a variety of statements. Um, one thing you can see right away is that there are a lot of different colors that are reflecting the range from strongly disagree to strongly agree. So what that means is there's no one single strong opinion about chronic wasting disease from hunters. There is a lot of heterogeneity or variability in what hunters think about chronic wasting disease. If we drew the line at 50%, say that's the median response, the gray color is neither agree nor disagree. So in terms of human health, there seems to be a kind of mix between agreement and disagreement. Um, similarly with uh, whether CWD will eventually disappear, a uh, mixture. Um, chronic wasting disease will be eradicated on, on mass or on the majority, hunters think no, that CWD will continue to exist in Alberta. Um, it may remain at a relatively low level, the majority seem to think that. Um, will it result in the extinction of cervids? No, again, somewhat disagree. It seems to be the majority response. Is it a threat to wildlife herd health? Yes, some would agree. And in fact, a very large response strongly agree to that. We can see that in the circled areas. So there is concern about chronic wasting disease, but is there's also a view that it will continue to exist and perhaps at a relatively low level. And of course, these are all perceptions. Let's move to what hunters think about chronic wasting disease management by hunters. What do they think about providing additional hunting opportunities or freezer locations or voluntarily submitting heads? You can see by and large those are blue on the strongly agree side. And you can see the only one that seems to have some uh, disagreement or fairly uh, mixed feelings, if you like, is this one on reducing local deer herds where CWD is most concentrated. 26% saying they strongly agree, but a fairly sizable percentage strongly disagreeing. Now that's where some of the heterogeneity in hunter opinion and hunter preferences around management programs arises. This is a bit of a comparison between results from 2007 and 2017. So it's a 10 year span. And if you just without looking in detail, if you glance at those graphs, you don't see a lot of difference in the pattern between 2007 and 2017. So not much has changed if, if we believe these uh, data. Um, there's a little bit of variation, but even though the spread and prevalence has uh, really occurred in Alberta, there hasn't been a significant change. Now, we have to take, take into account that perhaps some hunters have stopped hunting between 2007 and 17, perhaps because they are concerned about chronic wasting disease. So that may be suggesting that we have a different group within these de this 10 year span. But even so, it's quite interesting that there hasn't been a significant change. Let's look at this one. I no longer consume deer meat because of chronic wasting disease. And in fact, it's slightly stronger in the stronger disagree box, 72% uh, in 2017 versus about 58% in 2007. So hunters are not stopping the consumption of deer meat because of chronic wasting disease. If we look at hunting behavior and chronic wasting disease management, again, this 10-year span, we're seeing those similar patterns once again between the 2007 and 2017 periods. Let's look at that middle one again. I eat or give away deer meat before I get the test results. Pretty similar pattern. If anything, there's a stronger bar on the strongly disagree. So hunters are disagreeing with I eat or give away the deer meat, but there's a fair amount of um, emphasis on the right-hand side of that graph as well, where they strongly agree that they eat or give away the deer meat before they get the test results. So it's, a, again, a mixture of views on the risk or the perception of risk in terms of chronic wasting disease and eating the deer meat. What would hunters like to see in terms of engaging in chronic wasting disease management? These are just some of the programs that we describe to hunters. They could uh, receive uh, funds that they could donate to conservation purposes, gift cards um, in exchange for additional effort in hunting and additional submission of deer heads, uh, tags or points towards the draw system or expansion of the hunting season. I'll talk more about this shortly. 
And you can see that the, the majority of hunters would prefer to see a program that expanded the hunting season or gave them extra tags or points towards the priority draw system that we have in Alberta. Let's look quickly at the quantitative analysis we've been doing. We're, we're economists, so we're interested in understanding how behavior may change and so economic behavior of taking trips um, spending money in communities, spending time in communities, uh, hunting, engaging in hunting. So we're interested in trying to understand why hunters go to certain height sites. Are they influenced by chronic wasting disease? And would they be influenced by the, a management program that may offer them additional hunting opportunities, perhaps extend, extended seasons in other parts of the year? So we've really been modeling their choices of where and when to, when to hunt and how many trips they take trying to explain that by things like travel costs, chronic wasting disease prevalence, and other variables. Um, this is work by Lucy Shi for her PhD thesis, and Pat Whitesmith and I are helping with this work. But what do we find? Uh, I'll just give you some statistical estimates and kind of walk through them. First of all, what effect does chronic wasting disease prevalence have? It's negative, but not statistically significant, which, um, again, this is something we'll see throughout the, the uh, data that we present. We're finding some effects. They're mixed. It, they're not particularly strong in the sense that chronic wasting disease prevalence doesn't seem to be um, a, a factor that negatively affects hunter participation, at least to this point. Hunters are interested in extended seasons, and we offered them extended seasons either in October, before our regular November season for, for mule deer, or in December, and they would prefer December, extended season in December, significantly more than the October season, and they prefer it uh, in terms of an extension to the regular season. It's not as good as the regular season, I and mean, there's a negative sign there saying that the extended season is negative relative to the current season in November, so they would rather hunt in November, but they do prefer the extended season relative to not having it. What are the economic benefits of extended seasons? If we opened up extra seasons, hunters would take more trips and they would be spending more money. And we can see in this particular graph, in certain WMUs, is the WMUs in the 100 series or 200 series in Alberta, those, some of those are affected by chronic wasting disease. That economic benefit would be about $120 per hunter per season. So by the number of hunters, multiply that by the number of hunters, we get an idea of what an extended season would do in terms of generating economic benefit. And again, this is a benefit that's created in part because hunters are not dissuaded by chronic wasting disease prevalence levels or spread levels, and they're interested in participating in the management of chronic wasting disease. We resampled our hunters. We went back to the same group that gave us responses in the 2017 survey and we asked them to complete a similar survey for 2018 and we got fewer responses to this one because 631 of that about a thousand responded which to be honest again is a very good response rate we do worry about sample selection bias so did they harvest any cervids by and large yes did they submit for testing by and large yes not everybody but uh, two-thirds of people said they reported submitting them for testing why did they submit? Well, largely because they were in mandatory submission zones, but they're also split between being worried about CWD risks and being concerned about the CWD effect on wildlife. And again, we see a mixture of perceptions and responses. Some hunters are quite concerned about CWD, and that's the primary reason for submitting heads, um, either concerned in terms of their human health aspects or because of the wildlife population impacts. Why didn't you submit? We asked that question if they didn't, um, largely because they weren't in mandatory CWD areas or because they were not worried about eating deer meat and some of the risks to family and friends. This is an interesting set of responses on their um, satisfaction with the program in Alberta that we use for submission of heads. How satisfied were they with freezer locations? By and large, very satisfied. Um, this is a, a very good response if you're uh, the province of Alberta and the program that's been going on for several years. They're, they're very pleased with the instructions from Alberta Environment and Parks. Of course, the one that troubles them is the time lag. How satisfied were you with the time lag? And you can see that's where people were very unsatisfied. They were hoping to get responses fairly quickly, um, but it does take some time, especially as the number of heads submitted increases. We asked them how long it took before they got the results from their submissions back. 
and you can see it's a pretty pretty equal split between less than a month, a month to two, and more than two months. And in some cases, if you harvested a deer late and your your head was in the queue so that it's quite late in the process, it would take some months before you got the response back. And that, of course, is the issue that troubles hunters more than anything else, it seems, within the management program. We asked hunters about their perception of where seed weed prevalence is the highest. And we asked them to click on maps and tell us where they thought the CWD was above average. The map that gets produced from the hunter perception is the one you see on the right hand side. And it's actually a fairly accurate description of where the, the highest levels of prevalence are of CWD within the province. So at an individual level, hunters may not know the exact numbers of where the CWD prevalence is higher or lower, but as a group, they have a pretty accurate perception of where CWD risks are highest or where the prevalence levels are highest. As I mentioned, we also looked at the draw licenses. Now, this is not perception information. This is not opinions from hunters. This is looking at their actual uh, applications for licenses in terms of mule deer and our draw system. So we looked at data from 2005 to 16. Uh, we looked at the total applications. We had information, thanks to Alberta Environment and Park, on success rates, on um, the number of heads that were submitted for CWD from those wildlife management units, on the number of cases and the prevalence rates. And we were examining whether the application rate changed over time in response to chronic wasting disease levels, prevalence rates, or any other factors that we were including within our uh, analysis. And just a quick preview of the results, there doesn't appear to be a negative effect on hunter draw applications by changes in CWD. Um, draw applications are increasing even in areas where CWD has a large number of positive cases. If we just look broadly at Alberta hunting license sales, the very top red line is the draw applications received in total, so the demand is quite strong um, over time. If we looked at resident mule deer, resident whitetail deer applications, um, those lines are, well, they're, they're pretty flat, but they're, uh, they're continuing throughout the framework. Graphing total CWD positive mule deer head counts, again, you can see that they've been increasing over time, but on the right-hand side, so have the mule deer draw applications. We look at spatially the positive head counts that are reported by Alberta Environment and Parks, 2005, 10, and 15. You can see the increasing numbers as we work through time and spatially where those heads are located, the positive head counts. But if we look at mule deer license applications, the number within each wildlife management unit, this is within a region of Alberta, we can see that there's not a significant change. They change slightly over time, but those have not responded significantly. If we look at the data in terms of a regression analysis, this is work that John Patterson Williams is leading, and there are a number of models here. Let's just focus on this particular variable. So this is, can we explain the demand for licenses, draw licenses by Alberta hunters over time with a variety of variables, and when we include chronic wasting disease head count, positive heads lagged one year, it's negative, but not statistically significant. So there doesn't appear to be a statistically significant impact of chronic wasting disease on draw license demand. Let me switch now to a couple of uh, results found by Ellen Goddard and her co-authors, graduate students, and Marty Lukert and his co-authors. They've been surveying the general public and their perceptions of chronic wasting disease management. So they've been surveying across the country, hunters, landowners, the general public, rural residents, and Ellen Goddard's work has spanned several years, so we'll see what happens over time as you survey the public about perceptions of chronic wasting disease. So here's one set of results. It says between 2009, the dark blue, and 2018, the reddish line, and you can see there's not a large change but there does seem to be an increase in the perception that elk and deer meat will cause CWD infections in humans. Perception, again, these are perceptions by the public or whether people have concerns. What do they think about management strategies? Well, if you look at these bars, this goes from blue 2009 to the grayish bar, the most recent 2018, you can see there seems to be an increase in the acceptance of programs like submission of heads, targeted culling, interestingly, if you look at those 
second and third categories. Targeted culling where CWD is most prevalent was not particularly accepted by the public and now increasingly so. Taking no action is unacceptable and has been for a considerable amount of time. And all the other programs that are listed here seem to have positive support from the public. As I mentioned, the culling ones seem to be the ones that have the most significant change over time. Um, freezer locations, additional hunting tags, both in public meetings, pretty constant. This is a slightly different description. This is uh, Marty Lukert and Jeff DeRoche's work. These are asking people about different management strategies. The bars in this case are different groups. The blue is general public, the orange is hunters, landowners are gray, and the light blue are rural residents. So again, a national survey. And they were asked about a variety of different approaches to reduce chronic wasting disease, uh, increasing hunter harvest, or using sharpshooters, or reducing movement of carcasses. I think the things to take note, this graph is a little difficult to interpret, but let's look at this particular one. This is restricting movement of carcasses and hunted products. This is one where there's a difference of opinion. The general public is supportive of this. That's the positive side, the, the top above zero part of the line whereas hunters and landowners are opposed to this. So this is one where we've got a difference of opinion between hunters and landowners in this case and the general public. The hunters and landowners are opposed to the notion of restricting movement of carcasses. And if we look at sharpshooters on public land or sharpshooters on private land, all groups are very opposed to this, hunters more than others, but all groups are opposed to using that as a strategy for chronic wasting disease management. These are chronic wasting disease attitudes by province from a fairly recent June 2018 survey. Again, the same types of questions. Do you believe that eating elk and deer meat will cause CWD-related infections? Uh, there's quite a lot of similarity across the provinces, and there's some variation. One of the reasons I put this graph in here is because we do see some separate responses for Ontario, the yellow color that's within the graph. And there's some similarity, I think, largely, perhaps except for the concern about eating elk and deer meat because of CWD, the second group. That one appears to have um, less support, if you like, from Saskatchewan and Manitoba. But by and large, people are, are saying they agree with being concerned about elk and deer meat. Um, but the strong support is to take some effort to eliminate chronic wasting disease or to contain it to a geographical area. So what are the general conclusions? I repeated these, or I'll repeat these from earlier. Majority of hunters are not changing their behavior, or at least that's what we see in the data. Of course, there are some who have, but there are others who have not. Hunters may have stopped hunting or started hunting for other species. Uh, so we, do, we may see that in some other data that we would examine, but at least in terms of the aggregate demand for licenses or trip demand, we're not seeing a, a large response. But that doesn't mean that hunters aren't concerned about chronic wasting disease and the impacts on wildlife. Uh, perhaps CWD prevalence isn't high enough to change behavior, but they're very interested in participating in management programs. The management programs they prefer most are season length extensions and extra tags. And the general public also has preferences for monitoring and management by hunters. They're also supporting the notion of taking action and increasingly supportive of action by hunters and management by hunters. So with that, I'll conclude this presentation and, of course, uh, welcome questions or comments. My email address is provided uh, in the conference proceedings and I'd be happy to follow up with anybody. And let me again thank our sponsors for this research, our funding partners, Genome Canada, Genome Alberta, and Alberta Innovates. And again, thank my colleagues both in the University of Alberta and with Alberta Environment and Parks for the uh, support working in this research area.